Hi and welcome to Empower TV. My name is Josephine Campbell, but Empower TV is about you. Today I have Sally Kalash at the studio. Sally Kalash is a PhD and an expert in how to make decisions. So what we're going to talk about today is how you as a leader can avoid making the wrong decisions. Welcome Sally. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Really looking forward to it. And so am I. And I'm going to tell you a little <laughs> bit about why I'm looking forward to talk to Sally. Because Sally is uh, a behavioral economist. She's been teaching at Harvard University. Today she works as a consultant, as an expert for global organizations and help them on how to make the right decisions and how to affect their customers also making the decisions, decisions which are beneficial for the company and also beneficial for the customer. Yeah. Yeah. You need to have an ethical approach in order to be able to work in an authentic way with customers. So, yeah. Yeah. And you've written a book about this, which has just come out. Mm -hmm. And in the book, there's also a really interesting tool. Mm -hmm. It's a tool that maps biases and you can actually measure your decision-making style, or do you want to explain a little bit about it? Yes, so within behavioral economics, what you have is you have um, identified a range of biases. And I think at this point, you have somewhere a bit over 200 biases that you work with. A bias is a decision mistake. That would, It would always be a decision mistake. And the challenge is that given you have 200 different biases, it's really, really complicated in order to work with your decision-making style. So what do you do? In this, I think a lot of my colleagues and myself have been looking into how can we decomplexify a, very, a quite a complex field. And what I did in the book was I created different indexes for each bias category. Mm -hmm. A bias category might be, I think we, we do have a, 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 a wonderful picture of it over here, mm -hmm. where you can see the way we make decisions, for instance, that we, we, we become quite overconfident about our ability to make the right decision, or in specific situations involving risk, we turn out to be quite risk averse and try to avoid making a decision, or when we get a good idea, we try to confirm our ideas and hypotheses rather than trying to uh, falsify it. So we have a range of different biases intervening uh, with our ability to make the right decision. And what I did was I categorized these into eight different indexes and created a questionnaire that I send out to organizations that might be you know, on an executive or managerial uh, level. And they can test on each different index what, to, to which degree are they biased. And all I work with is context effects. So given the context of the company, if you have a very bold, lean and mean company, certain biases would be more predominant. In another company, let's say a financial institution, you're much more risk averse, so those biases would, would, would be predominant. So I, I try to map where the, the different decision mistakes might intervene uh, with good behavior and decision making, and start to work with companies in order to mitigate or reduce the effect of these biases. I mean, biases are so inherent in the way we make decisions that um, they're impossible to eliminate, we would always carry them. It's, it's simply just part of us. And in many situations, they're actually quite good as well. I mean, there is an upside in being irrational. Yeah. <laughs> there is an upside in being What irrational. is the upside of being irrational? Well, I mean, just the way that, you know, one would say uh, group think, for, in for instance, mm -hmm. any biases linked to group think um, hinders innovation in companies. Um, you know, if people start to, to, to um, work uh, based on, together based on where they agree rather than where they disagree. Mm -hmm. So you reduce uh, different perspectives in decision making processes. Yes. People know group think quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And in many companies, and especially in innovation processes, you try to eliminate the, the biases arising from group think. But the upside of group think, group think is that when I see someone that, when, you know, resembles me of me, or if we have a common ground, we have much 
a much better time working together. It's much more pleasant, you know, it's much more friendly. So you, you start to create some sort of cohesion in organisation and a lot of the cultural cohesion in organisations actually do arise from groupthink biases. That we start to look for how are we you know, similar rather than different. Exactly, and that's what happens a lot in the financial sector where I know you're also working, right? Because yes. they're pretty risk averse, but now there's a wake up call and the financial sector has started to focus more on innovation. Yes. And then they have a group think of being risk averse because that's in the nature of sure. the financial industry. How do you work around that when you want to innovate? I think you need to, to, uh, to begin with, you need to acknowledge that group, uh, group think or risk aversion have, has had some benefits for the industry. So just, you know, tossing the baby out with the water would be, you know, it, it, you need to step wisely in that process and acknowledge where is this a benefit and, and where is it not. I know that a, an approach that a lot of financial institutions have uh, taking to themselves is the prototyping, prototyping approach mm -hmm. where they take a, a part of the company uh, like a bag, you know, like, you know, it's, it's not really integrated in the company and they create a sort of a corporate garage where they start to innovate and, and, and experiment. Mm -hmm. And when they hit something that they think this is, this is good, some companies, not all of them, but some companies are actually quite good at integrating that into the company context and texture and can you know bring it to life let's say Danske Bank and Mobile Pay were quite successful in that right yeah so but it's it's still like a separate it's a separate organization se with different people and a yes. different location yes so that is something you can do and that has turned out to be quite popular for financial institutions being who they are being risk averse as they are mm. that approach is actually quite good because they acknowledge that they have a bias being risk averse which might be good in their core business, but it's not good for innovation. So they have to separate that I, part of the organization. I think some organizations probably acknowledge that and mm -hmm. some just turn, you know, look for other companies. Oh, they, they you know, they succeeded, succeeded with that. I'm just going to do the same. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think some of it is also just mirroring what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for a, a risk averse organization, that is actually a good idea where you include um, overconfident people mm -hmm. in a process, but you do it in a contained way. Yes. Um, but I think you would probably ruin a lot of the organizational culture as well if you just, you know, toss them in, inside the company and say, just go, go, go ruin something. Right? But that, that's, that's what companies have been doing yeah. many, many times. They hire people who they think mm. are innovative mm. and entrepreneurial and they put them inside the organization and say, go innovate, go be entrepreneurial. Sure. And then those people get beaten up. Exactly, exactly, because they're kind of working t against the tide, right? Yeah. You know, all the organisation, the flow is in one direction and they're trying to work against it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have buy-in from the top and if you don't have a quantity of, of people that is sufficient enough, you're just going to turn, you know, frustrated in that process. Yeah. But going back to the, uh, to, the, to the tool, I think the interesting thing about, about it is that it gives you a common um, language in order to start to talk about Perhaps not so much how do I make great decisions better, but how do I stop making poor decisions in strategic situations? Because I think, you know, given that we're biased and we make approximately uh, 35,000 decisions a day, it's really, really difficult to start to implement that tool in every aspect of all the decisions we make. You can't do that because no. you are taking a lot of decisions exactly. instantly and by gut feeling. Exactly. But you can work with your mental, uh, men yes. mental processes. You can't work with your mindset. We do that with the mental training. Exactly. But it takes time. It takes time and you need mm -hmm. to get start to get into a flow and you, you also need to start to prioritize what sort of decisions are critical enough that I need to work on them on a systematic 
and a strategic level, right? Yes. And then acknowledge that a yes. lot of the decisions, they just, yes. they're made by gut feeling. Exactly. And if you have all that, you have the same tool and you're taking the same test, mm -hmm. then you can start to say, okay, you're making that decision because you're quite overconfident. Perhaps in this situation, we need to have another approach. Do we have a risk averse guy yeah. <laughs> in the midst of us, right? Wonderful. In that way, it's a little bit like the thinking hats. Do you exactly. know the bonus six thinking exactly. hats? Exactly. Then yeah. you can start to include the different voices and perspectives and and you know the the most um, uh, loud shouting people don't get all the you know the voice time right so so you can use it in that context and you can you can also use it you know when in, in your more structural approaches in your organization if you want to create transformations start to think about where can I where can I anticipate that the mistakes would probably arise and how can I start to include countermeasures in order to mitigate the effect Mm, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Do you want to explain me a little bit about the tool? Like if we take it from the top, what is what are the eight different uh, dimensions? Sure. sure. Yeah. Um, so the different uh, dimensions are um, it's it's an overall category of, of of different biases, and one of them, which is we we often call it the mother of all biases, mm -hmm. because if you that bias enhances the effect of all other biases mm -hmm. and that is overconfident. All of us are quite overconfident mm -hmm. um, in our ability to uh, be successful, in, in our ability to be exact, in, in uh, when we compare ourselves to other people we often think we're better than, than them, we think that we're better than we are. That creates a lot of problems. Let's say for instance you're trying to plan a process in that planning, you're over, often overconfident. Ah, oh, that, that won't take that much time. And then suddenly, especially in complex pro projects or in construction projects, you see that time starts, you know, you, you should have put aside three times as much time as you have done in that situation. So that is one index. Mm -hmm. Another one, which is quite frequent, is goes against everything we know within science, which is over conf uh, confirmation bias. Confirma confirmation bias is that you get a good idea and then you start to confirm it rather than falsify it. And if we follow the, the, you know, the falsifi uh, falsification method, you need to start to falsify your hypothesis in order to test them. But we seldom do that. Mm -hmm. So, and bounded awareness is that we have a problem uh, focusing on m more than one thing at a time. So we're quite bounded in our, in our, in our focus, which means that a lot of important stuff just simply falls out of our focus area. Because oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, sometimes I measure executives' uh, mental state. Mm. And I have a little gadget that can actually measure mm. your mental state mm -hmm. by your breathing. Mm -hmm. And what I see is a lot of male alpha leaders, they are focused yes. most of their working time. They either, like in... in like a non-mental state where they're just being or they're yes. super focused. Yes. And uh, you can also be calm. Yes. When you're calm, yes. you have access to all of your brain, yes. to the frontal lobe. But when you're focused, you're only yes. present in your um, amygdala, in, your, yes. uh, in the oldest part of the brain. Mm. Okay. But it's, it's a problem. I mean, <coughs> sorry. You can say that when to be focused is a good thing. If we can't be focused, we can't really achieve much, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is that we navigate in quite complex contexts where you need to have an eye for several different dimensions. And when, when, when you're affected by bound awareness, you're focusing on what you see is in your mind all there is. So anything that's not within your part of your mental awareness simply just drops out or seems less important even though if you were more objective in that situation you would probably include much more than you're able to do and bounded awareness is not something you can't just say oh can you stop being focused no. or can you you know expand your awareness we have the cognitive capacity that we have and we need to just work with that so in that simple situation, what you simply do is you include more voices in a process. Well, that's one way to do it. But I would say mm -hmm. that if you relax, if mm -hmm. you relax and you relax your breathing and you become more aware of your body, mm -hmm. your brain starts relaxing. Mm -hmm. And that way you get access to more parts of your brain. You get access more information.
when you're relaxed and when you're super focused and high on cortisol, which is a stress hormone. What do you think about that? I think being stressed probably narrows your, your focus quite a lot. Mm. So the ability of relaxing, taking a deep you know, a breathe, or just simply, I often advise people to, 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 to simply not make a decision if they feel that they feel squeezed or pressured. I agree. Go home, eat a good dinner, have a night's sleep, focus on something else and then come back, you probably have a new perspective on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, then we have what we already talked about, group biases, risk aversion, we've also been talking about. Mm -hmm. Emotional biases are simply that we see, emotional biases, all the rest of the biases are cognitive biases, stuff happening in our head. Mm -hmm. A new field is the emotional aspect of it that we know, um, so for me right now, being quite pregnant, this room is quite hot. <laughs> right? That affects my ability to make decisions. Mm. I uh, probably become more impatient mm. on what to get out of this room. Mm. <laughs> you know, so in that way, all these physical, uh, um, you know, stimulus uh, simply affects my decision making process. If I were angry, mm -hmm. that would also affect my decision making if I get scared. Mm -hmm. So all these different emotional parts of our, of our um, being affects the way we make decisions and the emotional biases simply measure how does different emotional um, interventions affect decision making processes. Mm, and they can be very physical like you being pregnant they're and being always, hot now. Exactly, they're always physical. What we do is we simply measure um, the skin mm -hmm. so we see well um, do you feel hot? Mm -hmm. uh, are, are you sweating or you know what what sort of uh, is your skin charged mm -hmm. and then based on that we can anticipate okay then you know you would probably start to lean towards these decisions rather than these decisions mm -hmm. depending on how mm -hmm. how how you physically react in mm -hmm. the situation mm -hmm. ethical biases are they actually combine to to bounded awareness and we know that people have the sensation that they're quite much more ethical than they are so a lot of the ethic unethical activity that happens in companies or in real life happens on a more latent or unconscious level mm -hmm. and we all have a you know a, a, a specific it depends on from person to person but we have this 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 space where we think well it's okay to, to lie a little bit or it's okay to take office supplies or and that can you know expand depending on the situation but ethical biases is actually something that that affects human interactions quite a lot mm -hmm. um, and it affects also the way we make decisions and what sort of decisions and we can measure that as soon as unethicality enters a company and that is not hindered or stopped it starts to create a, a um, you know, like 11 it, it just it, 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 it's, it's quite difficult to stop and you see that with uh, during the financial crisis a lot of the companies the financial companies that went into bankruptcy. Uh, I, I wrote about one of them in my in my book, Lehman Brothers. I was describing the unethical culture in the organization. And the thing is that if anyone has seen the, the film um, Wolf of Wall Street, you know that, you know, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, he, he actually started off as a good guy. You know, he was really polite and nice. He had a wife and he wanted to do good. And within a short period of time, that unethicality simply overtook him and it's not you know it's not a monster outside where you can you know point out to a person and say you've always been unethical it's simply something that's latent in us and it can be activated by groupthink groupthink and organizational culture etc mm. um, and the last thing is categorization biases which is a, is a much more complex uh, set of biases comes from the way we we categorize um, our reality into boxes and, and what sort of and decomplexify our, our, our context and what sort of biases arise from that. Mm -hmm. So I measured all these different in order to see where where can I anticipate that decision mistakes would be more predominant mm -hmm. and how can we start to intervene before they start to take over decision making processes. So coming back to our key question, mm -hmm. how do you as a leader avoid to make the wrong decisions? What is your like simple, most simple advice to give to people? Something they can take away with them right now. I think rather than thinking about um, where you want to go, start to think about how you want to get there. 
So the way I, I, I called my book Decision Strategy, which is the strategies you, pl you put in place in for the decisions that you want to make. So it's much more about process. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if as a leader, you need to start to think much more about how do I make decisions? And I think if you were, if, if you're squeezed on time and you only have one thing you want to think about, start to think about, am I overconfident? Because that bias, we, we, you can't eliminate all biases, but you can, you know, reduce the effect of other biases if you reduce the effect of overconfidence. And the way you can work with overconfidence is to work always, always, always with worst case scenarios or do a pre-mortem. If I, you know, really want to screw the situation up, what do I do? You know, if I really want to kill this project, or if I want to, you know, really, you know, uh, you know, push my company over the edge, what do I do? Start to work with these sort of, of, of worst case scenarios. And then you start to get some ideas of, okay, what sort of decisions would go into that process where I really fuck up? Sorry for my language, but, right? And then you can start to, you know, turn these around and say, okay, what do I need to do then in order to not to fuck up, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, if one, if you were to, you know, really intervene in one place, I would probably intervene there. Okay, so first of all, think about how you want to get to somewhere, not mm -hmm. so much where you want to get. Yeah. Secondly, start working with overconfidence. Yes. And thirdly, use worst case scenarios. Yes. And generously, Sally has offered that you can test yourself not your whole organization but just you so we're gonna post a link below the video here on YouTube if you click that link you get to the free test and you can test what biases do you have and please give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down we love to hear what you think about this video thank you for watching today